Hello students, this is Alan Boris speaking to you from my office here at the Anthropology Lab at Kenai Peninsula College. This lecture will be an introduction to the Denina language. There will be two accompanying lectures uh, with this, one on the sound system and one on the grammar. And the grammar will focus on um, the concept of language and thought. And in this one, we'll give an overview of the Denina language and different perspectives that will help you understand the culture. Um, and we can make that point with the first slide. Uh, this is Franz Boas as a young man. For you anthropology fans, anthropology students, uh, you know this name. Uh, considered to be the father of American anthropology back at the turn of the century, uh, starting the first anthropology department in North America at Columbia University. Uh, one of the principles of Boaz was this, that to understand a culture you've got to understand the language. And this is why we're doing what we're doing here. Not that we will learn everything there is about denying a language, but for you students, uh, you will get an introduction to the culture by an introduction to the language. Uh, this is squares with an indigenous view that language is fundamental, is fundamental to identity. Uh, a couple of quotes that illustrate this for the Sami, the people of northern Norway, Sweden, Finland, parts of Russia. Uh, uh, Israel Ruang uh, has said, language is the map of Sami reality. Uh, Benali and Viri have written for the Navajo, the Diné of the American Southwest. Quote, language is a social construct. It is a blueprint for thought, behavior, and social and cultural interaction and self-expression. The great Kiowa writer N. Scott Mamaday has said, language and the sacred are indivisible. The earth and all its appearances and expressions exist in names and stories and prayers and spells. And closer to home, Denina Elder Claire Swan has written and said, when they took away our language, they took away our ability to think in our own way. And we will return to that specific concept in the lecture on grammar, which will really focus on the relationship between language and culture, language and thought. But for now, we're, we're sort of setting the stage for how important language is in understanding culture and being a part of culture. Uh, it's important to again return to a point of view that uh, of different questions because there is and can be misunderstanding culture bearers denina people uh, see language as a vehicle of identity as it should be linguists are trained on the other hand to uh, analyze and understand the structure of language so um, culture bearers and linguists have a slightly different point of view. Anthropologists, as we said in one of the beginning lectures, uh, again have their point of view. Why is the culture organized the way it is? How is it structured? So linguists are looking at the structure of language. Anthropologists are looking at the structure of culture. And culture bearers are concerned with values and identity. Um, I hope that in some way a true understanding of this will come from uh, from this intersection of these three points of view. They need not be exclusive, um, but anthropologists, linguists need to understand that their view is not the only view. This intersection is what we strive for. Uh, and to 
whatever small extent will achieve that in this lecture uh, will have gained ground. So this map you've seen before, it's a map of territory, but it's also a map of language, the great northern Diné territories. Uh, and we describe the territorial significance of going from east to west. Uh, but these are also the language, the languages of the north of the Athabascan or Diné uh, Northern Athabascan territories. And uh, there are also the Southwest Diné, the Apache, the Lipan, the Navajo, and the Pacific Coast Diné, the uh, Hoopa and other tribes up here in Northern California and uh, Southern, reaching a little bit into Southern Oregon. The languages in Alaska, apologize for the fuzzy version. I lifted this off of the Alaska Native Language Center website and didn't do a very good job of getting the good clear version. Uh, this is the new new version. Uh, and of course, Denina is this language right in here. And, and they've adjusted the boundaries a little bit to better reflect Denina territory. Actually, I had pushed it down just a little bit down into this area. Uh, based on Denina sites at on the Mulchatna River, but uh, nevertheless, this is a very accurate uh, rendition of Denina territory. Uh, this map is based on similarities between the uh, languages, so the colors are carefully chosen to reflect the degree of similarity or dissimilarity between the languages. The blue and green are Eskimo Aleut languages, and uh, that uh, re reflects an entirely different language family than the Diné or Athabascan languages, which are in the reddish hues here. So to the extent you see color similarities, uh, you will see they are a reflection of differences. Denina, for example, is quite different from Gwich'in or Han. Uh, for one reason, Han and Gwich'in have ton are tonal languages. They have a quality of tonality. Does it go up or does it go down? Which Denina does not have and Atna does not have. So uh, the, the, the key, I guess, is the litmus test is mutual intelligibility and uh, the lines are drawn based more or less on the ability to understand uh, one another. Denina and Deghatan are very close in this chart, meaning a, rel a very similar degree of, uh, sim a degree of similarity. Uh, Denina and Atna are fairly close, reflecting a similar uh, degree of similarity. But they're entirely different from the different language family of the Eskimo Aleut. Doesn't mean there aren't words that have been borrowed, but uh, uh, but the, the structure of the language is different. So this is a chart of those Dene, Dene or Nadene if you, to the, bro, the broader concept uh, and or Athabascan. Nadene is the more appropriate term. Uh, and this chart also reflects historical uh, historical aspects. So the the uh, the more distant the languages are, the more distant uh, the the more time has lapsed since they have split. So we can uh, assume a core Nadene, and the first split was Haida, and that's only recently been really affirmed that Haida is. A part of this Nadine and continuing work will will um, sure be going on 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 this, leaving a Proto Tlingit Athabascan Eak language, from which at one point in time Tlingit split. So there are similarities in the sound system, for example, between Tlingit and and say Denina. And time goes on, and they're leaving a proto-Athabascan EAC, and at some point EAC splits off. 
leaving Proto-Athabascan. So Proto meaning an earlier core language, uh, sort of a pre, uh, pre precursor to these. And that splits at a certain point in time. Um, the Apachean group here, Navajo, Apache, Lipan, Kiowa, and uh, uh, the Pacific Coast, not necessarily splitting in this order, but the California and uh, nor uh, Southern Oregon, Northern California, Southern Oregon groups. But the core being uh, the Northern uh, groups here, uh, with the map we just saw with the Alaskan and Northern Canada Athabascan speakers. And here's Denina uh, highlighted here. So these are relationships among languages. This relationship reflects historical movements. Uh, there are ways to try to tease out the when these happened based on rates of language change and we'll touch on that uh, a little bit later in this lecture. Uh, we can add another language to this, uh, uh, as far as a language family, and that's the language of Ket. So Ket is an isolated language here in the Yenisee River area of Siberia. And uh, based on work, and here's the local variation of it here, based on the work by Edward Vida, among other Russian linguists, but for the United States and Canada, Edward Vida, a linguist at Western Washington University, has been traveling to that area and has established fairly firmly, I think, that the structure of Ket is similar to the Diné or Na Diné Athabascan languages of North America, primarily in looking at the verb structure. So it has a similar structure where there's a stem and prefixes, as will be described in the lecture on grammar. Um, so this is, has, is, is a great important find, and it was not just done overnight. He's been working on this for years. And Jim Carey and he organized a set of symposia, uh, mostly at UEF in Fairbanks, to explore the significance of this. But the short version of it, either um, this is sort of a Athabascan Diné homeland, and and this was reflects a remnant group that were uh, left behind, I guess you would say, as others moved to Alaska um, and into Canada. Uh, but we can't tell from the language uh, that. Uh, maybe the movement was actually the other way. In other words, there was a group that uh, moved back from Alaska, from the north, across the Bering Land Bridge and became established here in this part of Siberia. I think uh, it's most likely, uh, almost certainly likely, that this is some remnant group or they may have moved here from a core area. That's, that's possible as well. Um, nevertheless, I think it's uh, um, uh, uh, going to be generally accepted that this that Ket reflects a uh, uh, remnant isolate that uh, ref that uh, were part of uh, an earlier movement of peoples into Alaska, northern Canada, Ket a Yenisean language. This is from the Alaska Native Language Center and sort of describes the same thing that I described in that earlier chart. You can pull this up off of the Alaska Native Language Center website. I believe I got that from there. And here's Denina. Here's their spelling with a T uh, right here showing that relationship. Shimshian is actually part of this system. So uh, languages are mutually intelligible uh, and uh, we've talked about this. So uh, by definition an Atna speaker should not readily be able to understand a Denina speaker. But it's important to point out the differences one of gradation because of the way we make maps 
there's hard and fast lines as though you know you step 100 feet from one side to the other and all of a sudden different uh, language in fact there's probably one of gradation from a core area to another core area and there was a lot of overlap uh, Denina for it uh, for it does include some Alutig or Sugpiak words, Agutig, uh, a person same as me, Gashak. These are uh, Alutig words or Sugpiak words. There's Russian words, and of course English loan words in Denina. Uh, so uh, the language does reflect this um, evolution. But there are relatively few, actually, uh, loan words in Denina, probably because of the structure of Denina, particularly the structure of the verb. It does, the verb does not lend itself to borrowing words very easily. This, then, is Denina territory in terms of the dialects of Denina territory. So uh, there was, is the upper inlet dialect of the Susitna River area. It is closest, closely related to Atna. Obviously, there's movement here, and there's movement up here relatively easily uh, between the two areas. Uh, the inland dialect then occurs in this area, the prime, primary villages being Nundalton, which is down here, and uh, uh, Lime Village, which is up in this area on the Stony River. Today, uh, of course, in earlier times, there were um, many smaller villages. The Iliamna dialect is uh, primarily in the upper Iliamna Lake area. I think I probably should have drawn that more like so. And the Seldovia dialect was spoken in Seldovia and uh, the far side of Kachemak Bay. And then the outer inlet dialect of the Kenai Peninsula and the, uh, the uh, west side of Cook Inlet. So uh, these are the dialects as of today. Uh, there are uh, no speakers of the Seldovia dialect. There are no speakers of the outer inlet dialect. These are extinct dialects. The upper inlet, I don't know, I think there's there's only a few, uh, most notable being Saba Stepan, and uh, he's uh, certainly in his 90s, if not older now. Uh, Walter Johnson, I believe, is the last remaining speaker of the Iliamna dialect, uh, and there are probably about uh, 30 or so um, speakers of the inland dialect in Nundalton and out of Lyme Village. Uh, so it is definitely a language that is um, threatened. Uh, we know that uh, indigenous languages are becoming extinct at a very rapid rate and uh, we're, as we'll talk about in this lecture later, talk about efforts to revitalize the Denina language. The dialects then, uh, the same map here, a dialect is defined as mutually intelligible between groups of speakers but show pattern variation. Just as somebody speaking a New England dialect of English can understand someone speaking a Texas drawl or a Midwest twang, but uh, we can doc document the, the patterned variation between them. So for Denina, it can be sound variation, and that's the one we most commonly associate with uh, dialect differences. For example, in outer inlet, inlet dialect, in Kenai here, Bajuk is how you say caribou, but in the inland area, Vajuk. So generally speaking, what is an initial B in the, uh, the outer inlet dialect will be an initial V, in the inland dialect. That's a pattern. It's it's not random. It shows a pattern and so that's that variation uh, occurs. Why why these variations emerge? 
hard to say. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of ink has been written about it for just uh, languages in general, but languages do reflect identity, and and this might uh, be one thing that reflects the identity of the two parts of of um, the Nina territory. That's just one very one example. There are many. There's also lexical variation. Outer Inlet uses Nina for animal, whereas inland uh, dialect uses gaga. The same word for brown bear is also the word for animal, or mammal at least. So nina, gaga, these are two variations, and that's at a lexical level, meaning a word level. So sound variation, lexical level. There also is grammatical variation. When you view the lecture on grammar, you will learn that the verb consists of a stem and uh, a number of prefixes. Not all of these prefixes, but a number of these prefixes, usually two, three, four, sometimes five of these prefixes, which come in a very specific order and are morphemes. That is, they're not whole words, but they're parts of words. They're, um, they're a, a morpheme. And, it's, and for all of the dialects, it's, it's very specific. In um, Kenai dialect, however, uh, this, these two positions, the inceptive position, I will begin to right here, and the noun gender position, which we'll discuss in the uh, grammar lecture, are reversed. So in the inland dialect, for example, it would go from negative to noun gender to inceptive, whereas in the Kenai dialect it goes inceptive, noun gender, and so on. And that's a big deal. That's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's when you have that level of variation that means uh, a significant uh, separation in uh, ways of speaking. That, however, once you know that, uh, if you were an inland speaker versus an outlet, outer inlet speaker, you would be able to understand uh, each other without any difficulty. Just You would just know very definitely where that person's from. So dialects. So dialects are different from languages. Dialects mean uh, there is mutual intelligibility, just pattern variation. So uh, language use and language loss, and we have to talk about this very tragic story of language loss that has brought us to the point where Denina is uh, one of the world's most endangered languages. Uh, we could say that at the turn of the century that Denina were fluent in Denina, and very often in Russian, English, and often Norwegian or Swedish or Finnish. Um, but by 1970 or so, there were only about five speakers of the Kenai dialect and about 120 total speakers, whereas today there's about 40 speakers, give or take, and uh, they're all over 60, all over the mid-60s. Um, so we're going to try to talk about how we got to that point. To go back to the first point here, uh, about being multilingual. This is Sergei Kwasnikov uh, in Nanwalik. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. So Sergei uh, uh, spoke Denina. He spoke Russian. He spoke English. And he spoke Norwegian. And he spoke Sugpiak. He spoke five languages. And I know uh, I can verify that. I was in Nanwalik with some Russian archaeologists a number of years ago, and um, we were sitting waiting for the uh, plane in the in the village uh, center. And I was sitting with these Russians, and Sergey walks in and says a phrase in Russian. I think he probably knew the Russians were there, and they struck up a conversation. And then uh, I, I didn't know Russian, but I 
and introduced myself and we talked and I spoke a little Norwegian to him and of course he knew that and a few words in Denina he knew that and and of course he knew English and I'm just going to take his word for it that he spoke Sigpiak as well. So he's one of the last of a long line of Denina who were multilingual. Uh, generally speaking, however, it didn't go the other way. Russians did not learn Denina. No English, very few English speakers learned Denina. Um, maybe none, maybe a few words, but not many. The Scandinavians that were here did not learn Denina. And, uh, and so uh, Denina, uh, Denina has become this um, language on the verge of extinction. And a number of major events contributed to this. Um, this is the smallpox epidemic, the horrific smallpox epidemic between 1838 and 1841. This is actual data. This, this chart, this line here, is from uh, Fedorova's documentation of language, of a population, pardon me. And here's that horrific epidemic drop right here. A little bit of rebound and then again dropping. Uh, this is probably reflecting a series of epidemics. Um, and this then is the w Russian and uh, this is Creole. Creole would be uh, part Denina, part uh, Russian, but also baptized in the church as a special designation the Russians used and we tend not to use that today. Nevertheless, uh, this had a huge impact on the people and there was uh, at the same time uh, and in the church documents a conversion to orthodoxy. This reflecting orthodoxy, this is a icon in the Kenai church on the back of it is written the date 1797. This is a standard uh, icon. This is Our Lady of Kazan. She also has uh, trade beads that have been put into her, i um, not sure what they would call this, but this headdress type thing here. So there was a significant conversion to orthodoxy. Uh, whether it was a whole-scale conversion, as sometimes is implied by missionization, or rather an adoption of certain concepts of orthodoxy. When we talk about religion, I will make the point that it probably was the latter. That is, a lot of Denina concepts were, Im were, um, were embedded in orthodoxy and vice versa such that it was, we've, uh, Aaron Leggett and I have used the term indigenized orthodoxy and Catherine Knott and I in another publication have used the term indigenized orthodoxy. But one of the things that was adopted by Denina, in part by the smallpox epidemic, was the concept that things happen because of God's will. And I think it triggered, was triggered by the smallpox epidemic. In, in traditional Denia spirituality, things happened because of what somebody said, uh, so, so what somebody did, or even what somebody thought. Thoughts could trigger um, uh, actions. And that idea would have produced uh, that concept would have produced huge guilt in terms of this event because maybe it's something somebody said, somebody thought, maybe something somebody did. But orthodoxy preaches the message that things happen because of God's will. And so uh, that led to a lot of the conversion and adoption of that concept. The point for us here is that Church Slavonic became a language, I should have said not the language, but a language of spirituality. Uh, one inroad into Denina language. 
Another one uh, was the coming in 1882. I should have put that date on here. 1882 of canneries. The upper left is the first cannery in Cook Inlet, the second cannery in Alaska uh, at the mouth of the Kasilov River. You can still see the remains of some of this cannery. I uh, just was skiing by there the other day and you could still see where the nets were hung to dry. That brought a lot of people in uh, and we will talk about the significance of the canneries coming to Cook Inlet. Here's this this says Cook Inlet Salmon on this box so that box is being shipped out. So new people come in. The point I wish to make here is that English becomes the language of the workplace. So if you wanted to work, if you're Denina and you wanted to work, then you needed to speak English. Um, I counted 17 languages that would have been spoken in Kenai in 1900 going by the census and the place of origin of people. So it was a very eclectic place. There were Norwegians and Finns and Swedes and Germans and of course Americans and uh, Itali a lot of Italians and others from um, Chinese workers. Uh, but the language, the common language of the workplace was English and so there would have been impetus for Denina to learn English. Um, canneries didn't happen in the inland area and they didn't happen in the Iliamna area. So consequently the the language change, the, the forces of language change uh, were not as great in that area and that's why today we have more speakers from the Nundalton area for example than Kenai because of the cannery influence. That led to uh, and I will return to this point, uh, a, uh, the Denina in the Kenai area becoming second, maybe even third class citizens. So here's H.M. Weatherby, who was the cannery superintendent. He represents the emerging social order, the top of the emerging social order in the late 18 and early 1900s in the Kenai area. He was the manager of the Kasilov cannery and also was an Alaska Commercial Company agent. A lot of men came. This is um, Andrew Berg who was a Swedish speaking Finn. There's a part of Finland that um, was Swedish speaking and Andrew Berg uh, represents people who came uh, and they, they were people of a lot of talent uh, they could, you know, they could work in the lumber, they could be miners, they could do a lot of things. Um, in his particular case, he never married and never really contributed to the community, but becomes that second tier. And some of the, I take this man to be European origin, American, maybe Scandinavian, married into Denina uh, and, and stayed. I don't know who this is, but uh, this this becomes then the second tier of here's one here's two and this picture becomes the third level okay I can't do three very well here uh, and if you look at the eyes the eyes um, are not welcoming and that's because this man Weatherby took this picture and the Denina were in the process of becoming uh, third-class citizens in their homeland. And language, uh, part of that had to do with language, uh, forces of language change. But the worst, maybe, was the Indian U.S. policy, Indian po assimilation policy, that was in operation between 1887 and 1934 and continued on until statehood in Alaska. 
Uh, Sheldon Jackson was appointed general agent of education. So here's Jackson's statement on language. It is the purpose of the government in establishing schools in Alaska to train up English speaking American citizens. You will therefore teach in English and give special prominence to instruction in the English language. Your teaching should be pervaded by a spirit of the Bible. So language extinction was practiced. Uh, schools were English only and children were punished for speaking their native language uh, and it seemed to have been particularly harsh in Kenai. This is a school in the 1930s. This is the Kenai Territorial School. So these would have been the children who would have been punished for speaking Denina in school. The punishment consisted of for girls it, with dresses being forced to kneel on rock salt, uh, sharp little pebbles of, of salt, if they spoke Denina. Uh, they or the boys would have had their mouths washed out with soap if they spoke Denina. Uh, when I first came to this area over 40 years ago, uh, one of the first things Denina people would tell me, usually quite quietly and usually very personally, you know they used to wash our mouths out with soap for speaking our language. I know Denina uh, who would not walk down the soap aisle of the store because of the bad memory of having their mouth washed out for, with soap for speaking their native language. Um, Peter Kalifornsky, who we will talk about uh, quite a bit with language revitalization who later became one of the great indigenous writers of the United States. When he was in the third grade, Mr. Bachman beat him with a stick for speaking Denina, beat him so badly that he could not walk for three days. His legs swole up so that he couldn't get his pants on, he told me. Um, this punishment by today's standards is inconscionable. But uh, it was the policy of, of assimilation, forced assimilation policy. Language genocide led it, the thinking of the time to, um, to an Americanization and really had the effect of um, having a devastating effect on on identity. Uh, a horrific act for which the uh, American uh, education system, to my knowledge, has never apologized for. I believe they have in Canada, but not here. So that was a, that was a factor in language change. And there are people today who deny any knowledge of Denina, although they I know they were exposed to it as children. And we could say another um, factor is was then the this chart. This is for the Kenai Peninsula, but we could do a sim similar one for the Matsu area and and uh, was the the growth starting in the 60s and accelerating in the 70s and 80s, this almost exponential population growth triggered by homesteading, then oil, and then all the, all the associated economic activity. Um, leading to, um, so here's some early pictures. This is the Matanuska Valley, Denina Territory. This is early Soldatna. This is downtown Anchorage in the, I forget when that picture was taken. But the uh, growth of non-native people within Denina Territory and English, of course, being the language of, of that experience. So all of these factors led to Denina becoming uh, now almost an extinct language. 
So let's talk about language revitalization. Uh, fortunately for this area, James Carey came here uh, in the 19, er, uh, late 19, early 1970s, pardon me, and has done uh, magnificent work in, uh, in language documentation, language structure, recording stories, and uh, here he is in the anthropology lab. Uh, we're looking at, I forget what we're looking at there, uh, but I've known him for all of those years and uh, we can't, I can't say uh, enough about the work he's done and others. Joan Tenenbaum did a great uh, um, book, dissertation, really, PhD dissertation on the structure of the Denina verb and Others have worked on the language as well. And of course, we owe great uh, thanks to the people they worked with, the, the indigenous, the Denina, who took the time to work with linguists. Here's Peter Kalifornsky, Shempeet. Um, here's some more. Anton Ivan, Fedosia Sakhalov, Walter Johnson and Annie Johnson. There's Pete Bobby, Andrew Baluda. All of these took time to work with linguists to record stories, to document stories, to document language. And we owe a wonderful uh, indebted, we have a wonderful indebtedness to these people, these elders who recognized that uh, the language is identity. And even though, uh, even though it's second best uh, to record the stories, to put the information into books is uh, is a legacy that, in its own way, will allow the language to uh, to continue on. And I should em emphasize that these are not all of the people involved, but these are some of the major figures in uh, elders that have been involved in this. So there have been classes uh, here at Kenai Peninsula College. This is the first class that Peter Kalifornsky and I taught here at uh, Kenai Peninsula College in 1982. And uh, some of the students and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Danita Peter has also taught classes. Uh, here she's shown with Joan Tenenbaum. And uh, there have been uh, classes at Kenai Peninsula College, at the Kenichi Indian Tribe, uh, now there are classes. I'll show you some other pictures of classes um, up at the Language Center, uh, UAA, last semester. This is, uh, this is spring of 2013, but uh, uh, um, Marilyn Baluda taught a class in Denina at UAA last semester. All of these are important in trying to resurrect the language. Here's that one of the first classes. This is Peter Kalifornsky. Uh, he's ex he's showing Sandra Stewart Shaganoff how to how to make a sound, and uh, that's their father Targonsky in the background. So this is sort of an interesting interesting photo. Uh, here's a class that was done in the spring of 2012 at Kenai Peninsula College. Uh, focusing on reading and writing. And here's Dana Verhoosen. She's from the Netherlands, never, you know, never been to Alaska. And she wrote a story. I'm going to play this YouTube clip uh, to, uh, to let you hear. It's a short YouTube clip, but you can go to it yourself. There's a whole set of these of the students we just kind of set up a camera and let them talk. But she's going to say, in August, I came to the Kenai Peninsula. I fished for silver salmon on the Kenai River. I learned about the Denina language. I saw breakup. And I will go, meaning I will go home, with happiness and sadness. And here's her Denina version of it. Let's see if we can get this to play here. My name is Dana Verkosen. I'm an exchange student from the Netherlands, and I never came in contact, was came in contact with the Nina before this class. 
I took the, this class because I really wanted to learn something more about the natives in this area. And I'm written, really enjoying this class. No one's coming. Okay. Chuchuk do a benenke enendli gi te yarenener eshu. Katnu at naglariku ezel an. Denaina er kizaldin tuntat un iesh an. Chu noro chu che erden eich tereshu, which means my story. In August, I came to the Kenai Peninsula. I fished silver salmon on the Kenai River. I learned about the Naina. I saw a breakup, and I will go with happiness and sadness. Oh. <laughs> and it's, if you uh, put it in the Naina sentence structure, it is in August, this part, to the Kenai Peninsula, I came. Uh, on the Kenai River, Kenai River on, um, for silver salmon, I fished. The Nina about, I learned. Um, Breakup, I saw. And, and happiness and sadness with I will go. That's my story. Well, that's that was that was charming, uh, Dana, um, and I I I cut it off too early when I when I posted that because there was a nice round of applause. But there were some wonderful stories written um, from that original stories. This is you know this is not. Uh, not just copying s stuff. So people were learning the structure of the verb and putting it in. Another little, just a lot of different exercises we've done. Uh, here's, uh, you will, some of you will recognize Dr. Seuss here, but here's Dr. Seuss in Denina. Uh, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, selska he sluka, nutiha sluka, de geldeki sluka, de ditsa di sluka. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. So these are exercises that are fun to do because um, they, you know, they're sort of challenging, but we can uh, learn the structure of Denina by doing these types of translations. This is uh, a recent class. This is in January of 2013. This is Marilyn Baluda. She's uh, She's back here, first day of class at, in Tionic. Um, and this, she'd already done a class for adults, and this is her class that the Debona Foundation sponsors for the children of Tionic. And we wish her great luck in doing this. So there are a lot of different places that classes are being offered and classes are being done. And your, uh, the, under course materials, there are some of the uh, great YouTubes that ha have been done uh, on Denina language, uh, all focusing on revitalizing the language. So in addition to, um, to the uh, uh, classes, uh, this, this, I want to tell you a little bit about Peter Kalifornsky and and the work on his book. Uh, so Peter became, has become, he's, he died in 1993, but became one of the preeminent writers in an in indigenous language. I'm going to kind of flip to the next slide. Um, this is some of his writings. So he wrote in Denina, and then he would do a translation um, in English, a rough translation, and and uh, here we are uh, 
working on that, working on those translations and the Denina, editing it for his book, A Denina Legacy, Kalegi Suktu. Remaining Stories, The Collected Writings of Peter Kalifornsky, and you have that book in your, uh, on a um, PDF format uh, in your course materials. So here we are in the Anthropology Lab working on this book. It, it was four years in the making. I'm going to play just a little bit of one of the stories in the book, uh, uh, which... Uh, click on this and we'll just hear a little bit of Peter reading the mouse story and what you could do is pause it now and go to your book if you wanted and and kind of follow along I'll just play part of it because it's pretty long but you'll get to hear Peter you know he's reading he's not telling the story but he he's reading what he wrote so mouse story at the beginning. So called it, so called the name in a college. Technical talk, so ten 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 extra. So soko, soka, oho kalan, technic is. Yak soka, nakakalash. Technically, so, 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 okay, so, um, he's talking about a man who's walking to the mountains and he, and he uses, he walked and he walked and he walked. So it's a man who is, um, his, his village is starving and he's walking without hope. He's walking but he's walking to find an answer and he helps a little mouse over a windfall and in other words he treats a humble little animal with respect and uh, he gets to the mountains and he encounters uh, Gunkta Jalen, the mother of everything over and over and her husband Kujun and together because they sense that he has the right attitude they give him a magic pack of food that he is to return to his village and uh, sprinkle some down on that magic pack and it will turn to f turn to uh, a great quantity of food the people who are starving survive they gain strength and they begin to hunt again um, all because the man had the right attitude. So there's a wealth of wonderful insight into these stories about Denina and attitudes toward nature and Denina cosmology. And uh, I just want to say how privileged I feel to have been able to help Peter with his book. 
This is the only picture of us working together, by the way, in four years, so I guess we locked the door and said, don't bother us. Along the way, Peter, uh, Peter instructed me in a lot of things. I want to play a short clip. I had an old Sony boombox recorder and I would buy these cheap tapes from the and stick them in and just tape record the whole session. Uh, a lot of it was just mundane stuff but occasionally it was some very important stuff. I wish I would have had a grant and could have had a formal recording of everything because there's some wonderful information here but there's about 50-60 hours of tapes and this is just a little excerpt of one of them. Mao story. Oops. Now the Gashak. Here's the beginning. Um, okay. Did this have a so form? Mao story. Okay, sorry, I had a little technical difficulty there. Let's uh, try this again. Now the Gashak. Um, did this have a form? Did it? Did it? Could Could you draw a picture of a Gashak? Could someone? Or was the Gashak more um, something that existed but people couldn't see? Well, there seems to be no picture of form in, in the drawing except uh, That he passed and prayed and, and get right down to, to and he stayed with that praying until he started receiving that, that power. And he said something that to make his words come true. So as I say, it goes on for, um, uh, I don't know, a lot of hours, uh, and, the, and I would just thank Peter for giving me some of those insights and, uh, and for taking the very difficult time. It was not easy producing this book, and uh, uh, he was, in the end, pleased. We were racing against time. The book came out in uh, 1991, and within a year and a half, he was um, sick in the hospital and uh, would die within a short time. But this then became his legacy, and a denial legacy. Uh, had people not taken the time, Peter, Shem Pete, um, Pete Bobby, the many, many Denina elders who took the time to uh, do this language work, uh, we would be at a great loss. This, these, all of these will be recognized as some of the, some of the most important scholarly, scholarly work of our time. So back, that's the writing, and uh, we talked about this already, but a lot of, a lot, but much of this, these recordings that I made during that time, and and of course many of the recordings that Jim Carrey made and others made work their way into uh, this website that we have gone to. Here's a couple of kids, uh, Jerome and his buddy. This is over in Nundalton. Uh, they're looking at that website and uh, playing around looking at the territory, making the words and uh, this of course is the future. You know, this is how we're gonna, this is what's, what, what people do now. So uh, this is Peter's book. That's a great contribution. I just want to try to uh, illustrate some of the other wonderful books, not all of them, uh, that are available. Shem Pete's Alaska uh, was a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, stories mostly derived from Shem Pete. And Jim Carrey and Jim Fall edited this book, and it's a great resource for the Upper Inlet. Uh, Jim Carrey's Topical Dictionary is remarkable. It's a noun dictionary, primarily, um, but it has in one volume uh, all of the dialects, all of the words, all of the nouns, and 
Hopefully one day uh, a draft of his verb dictionary will be brought to general use. Uh, that's Albert Wassily's book. It's uh, referred to as a junior dictionary that stems from 1979. It's still available. The thing about dictionaries, they never go out of date. Uh, a lot of smaller books. This is Tabona Esnena, Tabona Land, and it uh, it's uh, for the Tionic area. It's uh, it's a, a great resource. And there's I don't know how many. I never counted them, but I bet there's 40 or 50 of these small little publications that uh, were produced mostly by the Alaska Native Language Center. Uh, here's another one, uh, Denina Language Lessons, and uh, that has some lessons in it. Uh, uh, Walter Johnson's wonderful I'll Tell You a Story, uh, uh, primarily for the Iliamna area. Uh, he uh, grew up in uh, Pedro Bay and uh, spent time in, I think, in Iliamna as well. At any rate, uh, now lives in Homer and uh, with Jim Carrey uh, produced this remarkable book. Uh, Joan Tenenbaum, uh, Denina Suktua, Denina Stories from the Nundalton area primarily. Uh, this is, this again is a, a great resource and been reprinted and uh, if any of these books, if you can get them, they're worth having. Uh, bilingual, everything on this page is bilingual in Denina and in English. Uh, Karen Ivanoff has done a, a, a beautifully illustrated book, Denina Eshnana, Denina Land, uh, for the primarily in the uh, inland dialect area, and the beautiful place name maps and, and stories in English mainly uh, by the people of Denina Life, and that's been that's pretty recent. I forget the date, uh, 2007, I think. At any rate, that's available, and uh, uh, one that would be great to have on the shelf. Uh, Andrew Baluda, um, my uh, stories, uh, or my forefathers are still walking with me. And uh, his, uh, his great contribution to Denina Stories, and it too is bilingual. Like Walter's book, it has a CD with it, so uh, that's a great source. And, uh, oops, I didn't mean to split off of that so fast. Uh, there's more. I didn't, you know, there's only so many I can put on here. I think almost all of them are in your uh, Denina bibliography. Uh, but, uh, um, and uh, a good place to find these is on the Alaska Native uh, Language Center website. Uh, I think most of them are published there or Lake Clark National Park. So... Uh, Denina Language Institute, uh, these, uh, a number of these were held at Kenites uh, Indian Tribe, that's KIT, here at the college, Alaska Native Heritage Center, uh, out at Spirit Lake. So these are just some images from those Denina Language Institutes where uh, elders were brought together for uh, language learning and uh, uh, practice and um, just uh, attempts to keep the language going and these have been wonderful um, so I get to take the pictures I'm just show you some more pictures of these um, here's Helen Dick uh, and that's here, her here as well she's here with her dad Pete Bobby there's uh, Andrew Baluda Gladys Ivanoff General classroom scene, there's Walter Johnson, Danita Slauson, there's Jim Carrey back there, and, and um, these were priceless. Uh, they should have actually, the whole thing should have been tape recorded or video recorded. Um, but this, this is uh, all part of attempts to uh, 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 revitalize the language. Some more pictures. Uh, some of the youngers, Aaron Leggett, uh, Michelle Raven Moon, Shauna. Uh, th this is these are all at Kenai Peninsula College. Gladys and Mary again. Here we went to Kalifornsky Village, and here I'm talking to this group from the United Language Institute about events that happened at Kalifornsky Village. So that was uh, th that was a great 
uh, revitalization um, program. And last slide, uh, I know this has been long, but I just have to say this was one of the great teaching learning experiences of my life. Here we are out at uh, Spirit Lake and we're, we, got the, we got the old style learning here going on. We got a blackboard and chalk. No, no, uh, no internet, no uh, blackboard, no new style blackboard, no. Just the old way and uh, talking about language and maybe the key thing is this fire pit right here. Gathered around the fire, everybody's got their coat on, it was kind of chilly, uh, but uh, talking about verbs, talking about the structure of the verb. And one of the great things that happened uh, that night is I was, I went back home, but people came, gathered around the fire pit again, started writing verbs. And that's been the key for Denino language learning is understanding that verb. Um, we wish that we could do language by immersion, but there are uh, so few left. No one in the Kenai dialect, effectively no one in the other dialects except the inland dialect. And language by immersion puts huge pressure on the elders because you have to take time out of your life to work with people. So we do the next best. Um, we do it with the materials we have. And uh, the materials are now, I think, uh, there that we can resurrect the language as a written and read language. And with efforts by uh, other efforts, uh, we can then convert into language, uh, spoken language. and. Uh, one day, Denina will be taught in all the schools in Cook Inlet. I probably won't live to that day, but we have the materials to do that, and we can resurrect this language. And most important, what we can resurrect is uh, the, uh, the thoughts, ideas, cognition that is embedded in the language because it is the language of the place. It's the language of Cook Inlet. It's the language where most of us live, and in that regard, we can't let it die. We will keep it going. So I thank all the Denina elders and all the Denina people who have shared the language and shared their concepts with us, and uh, it has enriched my life and hopefully will enrich yours as well.